I'm Brad Carline, the Navajo County Attorney, and my partner Casey Clark, the Sheriff, can't be with us today. And our guest today is Jen Marson, who's the Executive Director of the Arizona Association of Counties. Right. First, Jen, thank you for joining us today. And can you tell us what ACO or the Arizona Association of Counties is? Sure. So ACO was created in 1968 and we're basically a nonprofit advocacy association that works on behalf of county governments and the elected officials at the county level. So who are members of ACO? So our members are the elected officials themselves. There are 10 categories of county elected officials. You have your assessors, county attorneys, clerks of the court, constables, justices of the peace, school superintendents, recorders, sheriffs, treasurers, and supervisors. The, the one that you didn't have was superior court judges, but yet you have JPs. Is there some type of reason why they're excluded from ACO? Um, I think because uh, the justices of the peace are elected in a more kind of traditional sense, whereas a re retained or a retention system for the superior court judges. Retention, at least in Maricopa, Pima, and Pinal. Oh, you're right. That's true. It, That's but true. By, and what I probably would think it would be is there the su superior court for the state of Arizona, so they're more considered state officials state official. than county officials. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, several years ago, mm, I want to say back in the mid 80s, actually the superior court clerks, though county elected officials, were deemed to be the, since they run the state court, that's why they run in a different election cycle than all the other county elected officials. And they're under a different employment policy right. under the state and that's right. everything else. It makes it interesting. Mm -hmm. So what does ACO do on behalf of the elected officials and behalf of the counties? So we are predominantly an advocacy association and most of our work has to do with advocating for county issues at the state legislature and in Congress. But advocacy to me means more than just being a lobbyist and, and working with the legislature. It's really about um, being a voice for counties in any way that promotes that county. So we offer education services to make sure that our county leaders continue with their professional development activities. We offer um, free webinars both to the elected official themselves as well as to anybody who's on staff at the county level just to make sure that um, professional development for those people is up to standard as well and that we're staying on top of things that are important in our society at the time, for example, like social media is a big thing right now. So we're going to do a webinar in the next few weeks about how to use social media to your advantage. Instead of just being a consumer of social media, you can be um, uh, putting social media out there yourself to advocate for your county, for your issue, for your constituents. And just educating the population as a whole of what the counties do. Absolutely. A lot of people don't know that counties really are the closest form of government to the people and they're involved in kind of everyone's daily lives. Counties do health care, obviously they do law enforcement, uh, transportation services, they do elections. A lot of people think that the state's elections are run by the Secretary of State, but they're actually run by your county elections directors and county recorders. All those things that we need to get the people of our counties and our state, including our state legislators, That's right. better informed about. That's right. On the, the advocacy lobbying side, mm -hmm. what are the big issues that you're dealing with on the federal level back in Congress on right now? The big thing right now is PILT, which is an acronym. Um, P-I-L-T stands for Payment in Lieu of Taxes. Long ago, back in the early 1900s, Congress essentially made a promise to counties, and that promise was for those of you that have a lot of forest land, obviously that land is untaxable for you. So we will compensate you for the fact that you can't generate any revenue on those lands. And as we have been in these kind of recession times, it's been a little iffy as to whether or not that funding is going to come to counties. For Arizona, 
That's about $34 million. So that's a huge chunk of money for Navajo County. It's 1.4 million. So if Navajo County doesn't receive its PILT payments, it has to find magically $1.4 million to compensate for that loss. And PILT money is general fund money, meaning it's not dedicated to a specific thing. So it's really hard to say for example, statewide, reporters always ask, well, what do counties spend PILT on? And the answer is they spend it on everything because some counties use it for roads, some counties use it for law enforcement, some counties use it for health care. And when $34 million is taken out of the county coffers, if the federal government chooses not to make those PILT payments, that's a big hole to fill. And my recollection is last year they didn't pass it to like April. The very last minute. And there is no bill even pending at this time for next year or this current year or future PILT monies. Correct. Um, there is a senator um, from Oregon who has an idea for a piece of legislation and we thought that it was going to be introduced um, last week but it wasn't so with the new congress coming in november it's anybody's guess as to whether pilt's going to get funded or not and then the question is does it get funded for one year only which is what's happened the last couple of years so that counties are kind of always waiting with you know biting their nails to see if they're going to get that funding or not or will a solution be proposed that proposes long-term funding so that at least we can breathe easier for a little while knowing that those payments will be coming on the state level, what have been the big issues that ACO has been working on on behalf of counties the last few years? The big thing is um, lottery revenue and of course just kind of a general maintaining local control. Um, when we hit the big recession years, what the state did in a lot of different areas that added up to big numbers for counties is they cost shifted or they literally demanded cash from some of our counties, um, or they put more responsibilities on counties and took responsibilities away from other entities. So we're trying to reverse all of those to get back to where we were before. Um, counties should not be writing checks to cover the state's budget woes. That should not be happening. Um, re revenues from the state lottery are generated all around the state. And so we feel that some of that lottery revenue should flow back to those different parts of the state via into the county coffers the way that they used to. That, I refer to the lottery revenue as kind of like a faucet. We want the faucet to be turned back on so that those dollars flow to counties every year, a long-term solution. What's happened in the last couple of years is the legislature has turned on the faucet for most of the counties, but only for one year. So. It's a sort of a win, but not a complete win. So we're, we still have that fight ahead of us. So from what I heard you say, the state shifted their financial problem on the backs of the counties to some degree. To a large degree. Uh, besides taking the lottery monies that his, the counties had historically received, what other kind of cost shifts did they do? Well, a huge one has to do with HERF. Again, that's another acronym. H-U-R-F stands for Highway User Revenue Funds. And HERF funds are monies that are derived um, from gasoline taxes and things like that. And it's supposed to be to go towards transportation costs. And there's a formula set in statute that's very complicated. But the formula allots that a certain percentage flow down to Arizona's counties. Um, two years ago, the legislature decided that they needed some of the county portion of HERF. HERF goes to counties, HERF goes to the state, of course. Um, the, so the state already got a portion of HERF. They took a portion of the county's HERF to pay for the Department of Public Safety. Department of Public Safety, while a fabulous agency, is not actually one of the mandated spending requirements for HERF dollars, but the legislature is the legislature, and that's what they decided that they wanted to do. So while counties are getting a portion of their original HERF dollars, it's not nearly enough. And what we have in some cases, in particular in, in counties like Navajo that have to deal with s snow and salt, and we have a faster erosion of roads because we cannot maintain and we're going to get to a place where we can only replace the road which is much more expensive than if we had been able through those dollars coming in to just maintain the road all along so herf shift is what we call it and it's a big deal what does aco looking into the future see with the budget problems with the state are they going to continue what's the basis for them and how might they impact the counties moving forward Unfortunately, I don't have good news. I think that the budget problems are going to persist. There is a, 
a court case out right now that has to do with whether or not the state should have fully funded K-12 education in years when they did not. And right now, as it stands, the court says, yeah, state, you should have. And if, that's, if that holds through the appeal process, the state will have to come up with, I think it's around $320 million to backfill what they should have given education over the course of three years. Um, the state doesn't have an extra $320 million just lying around. They have budget problems if the court case didn't exist. Now that the court case does exist, the problems are just exponentially larger. Um, the challenge that counties unfortunately face is when the state finds itself in a bind like that, they often turn to counties to pay the cost. As we talked about earlier, it's really a gimmick. It's not solving the budget problem at the state level. It's shifting the budget responsibility from the state to the counties who have responsibilities all of their own. They don't need extra responsibilities heaped on them by a troubled state. And the counties are already having their own budget problems with the recession right. and the very slow recovery from that. Right. And, you know, one of the things that sort of hurt counties a couple of years ago, a lot of counties had done very well with the budgeting process. They had um, kind of saved and some extra capacity in terms of taxing or they had saved some extra dollars in terms of budgeting and there was a proposition that was on the ballot that kind of wiped out all of that excess capacity. So counties were put in a really tough spot and then that's when all of the other cost shifts and cash payments and stuff kicked in and it really was kind of a double whammy. You also talked about ACO uh, providing education to its membership and mm -hmm. to county employees as a whole. What type of educational opportunities are you giving counties? We do a couple of different things actually. We try and host at least two conferences a year and the conferences are not meant to be revenue generators for the association but rather an opportunity to provide education. So we will bring in leadership professionals for example or management professionals to come and give workshops all day workshops or general session workshops to the membership about how to be a better leader, about how to better manage your time, about how to build the best team around you to get what needs to be done done. Um, so that's one way that we do education. We also offer different educational workshops which are shorter blocks of time and those can be on anything from media training to how to deal with tax exempt municipal bonds to how to better invest your county's dollars in the treasurer's office. So there's just a wide variety of educational opportunities that are out there. Another thing that you brought to ACO was a research analyst. We did. What is the function of the research analyst? So um, about two years ago, we surveyed the membership because we want to make sure that the association is providing what our members want from us. And what we learned is through that survey, they wanted us to have more of a research component. And so we switched around our positions a little bit. We brought in our current policy and research analyst. And what he does is all, all manner of things actually. Sometimes we'll get questions from our members. Um, a great question that came to us about four months ago was, I really want to know what the promotion practices are in the different counties. What do they look for when they're looking to promote an employee? Is it solely merit? Is it based on time and, you know, time served in your current capacity or, you know, all the different things. So he put out a survey to all the different HR departments to find the answer to that question. It hadn't been asked before. We couldn't find an existing piece of data that already had that. So we went out and we did that research. Um, we get questions from the legislature when they're in session all the time, you know, and that those are very time sensitive because the legislature moves quickly. So we answer things like, you know, how much um, do, do the border counties spend on enforcing border issues? So we have to go pull those counties and find out what that is. And then he puts together these great like almost like one page fact sheets on each of the issues that we encounter. That way we have it as a resource. If the question gets asked again, we have a good starting point. So those are just a couple examples. And didn't you also begin a database of just basic information about every county? Yes, we did. Um, we actually created some fact sheets. We have a, a website called yourcounty.org and it has great fact sheets about all the counties. There's demographic information. There's, of course, all of the um, department heads and elected officials, when the county was created, um, geographic area, just all kinds of statistical data that we update yearly to make sure that those are completely up to date. And yeah, it's been a great tool. 
That sounds wonderful. <laughs> and, and what was that website again, in case anybody wants to go look at the data you have? It's yourcountyoneword.org, Y-O-U-R county.org. And then our website is azcounties.org. And what type of information is at azcounties.org for the ACO? We have a lot. Um, obviously, all of our members are there. We have a whole advocacy section that talks of, that will have not only what we're working on in the current year, but it should have past information so you can see the bills that we've worked on in the past. Um, we produce every year after the legislative session what we call the enactment guide, and it's a listing grouped by category of all of the bills that passed that session. It has links to the actual text of the bill, a summary right there in the document of the bill. Um, all the vetoes are in there as well so you can see what didn't make it in any given legislative year all of the items that will be upcoming on the ballot in November are in there as well so that doesn't deal just with bills affecting counties but all bills that go through the legislative process N that's correct it used to only have the county bills on it but what we realized is of the mm, 300 some bills that pass in any given year three to five hundred eighty percent of them have to do with counties in some way. That's the kind of volume of work that counties do. And so we were only gonna add an extra 20%, so we just threw them all in. So those bills that affect county in a typical legislat legislative session, about what percentage is that? I would say it's about 75 to 80%. Now that's of the bills that pass. Right. Uh, I think the percentage is actually, let's see if there's about 1,500 bills introduced each session, we track about seven or 800. So 50% of all the bills introduced have some kind of county impact, and I would say 75 or 80% of all of the bills that pass and are signed have some kind of county impact as well. I think that kind of shows that number, how involved counties are with people's lives on a daily basis. Absolutely. It sounds like a lot of your advocacy work is reactionary on bills that are introduced. Is there also more of a, a, a proponent for bills, trying oh. to find bills that will benefit counties and helping uh, promote those within the legislature? Sure, absolutely. So our members are very active, and we're actually going through the process right now of setting our legislative agenda for 2015. And what happens is we will solicit suggestions from our members about things that they would like to see changed in the laws. And I think we have 19 proposals right now that come from a variety of different groups. Some are from the treasurers, some are from the sheriff, some are from the elections directors or the county recorders. And our board, um, a 30 member board, will deliberate them between October and December and set a final agenda. We tend to run between eight and 12 bills proactively in any given legislative session, and then we play active defense on, I would say, about 100 bills at least, active mm -hmm. um, a, a year as well. Just to give the, the audience an idea of what type of proactive bills you run, what kind did you run last session? So last year we had eight. Um, some of the ones that we were successful, we made some clarifications to the tax lien process to smooth it out. Um, the tax lien process is, uh, the short version is, it's what happens when a person can't pay their property taxes. What happens after that? What happens to that amount that's due? And so there were some um, ripples, if you will, that needed to be smoothed out a little bit, makes it a little bit easier on the sheriff's side, makes it a little bit easier on the assessor's side, programmatically, kind of behind the scenes. Um, we had a bill to make sure that there wasn't a conflict of interest in the office of the constable. We wanted to make sure that the constable who is serving as a constable cannot also be serving as a private process server at the same time. There's a conflict of interest there between those two and so we, we made sure that that was separated in statute. Um, we also made things easier for people in rural Arizona to attend community colleges outside of their home county. Used to be that there was this very long process called the out of county affidavit associated with attending a community college that's not in your home county. It really was a holdover from a really long time ago, didn't need to be there anymore. So we worked with the education community and the stakeholders and got rid of that process entirely. So we smoothed out the paperwork process. You had mentioned that the ACO board is 30 members strong. Mm -hmm. What type of elected officials are on your board? So our board um, has both geographic and office representation. So we have one representative from every county that's there to represent the county as a whole. 
We have one representative from every class of elected office, so one person who represents the assessors, one person who represents the county attorneys, et cetera. And then the membership in totality, all 331 elected officials, vote for the officers, and we have five officers. Um, you are one of our officers. You're our first vice president right now. And then we have our president is Supervisor Buster Johnson from Mojave County. Our second vice president is Supervisor Manny Reese from Santa Cruz County. And our third vice president is Chad Roche, who's a superior court clerk in Pinal County. You said five, and I think you named four. Who would be the fifth so one? So the last one is our immediate past president. He. Um, is still part of the officer chain, and that's Keith Russell, and he's a justice of the peace in Maricopa County. But that's a recent position for it him. It is. He started out as the assessor, and then there was a vacancy in his home JP precinct, and so he got appointed to that vacancy. You had talked about the different elected official uh, position groups getting together and assisting them. Do each of those different elected positions have some type of group, and how do you help them? Um, let me just think real quick. I believe that all of them do, and we, I'm just making sure all of them do. Yes, all of them do, and we help them in any way that they need. Predominantly, we are there to give legislative advice. Um, when they're pondering some kind of change that requires a change to statute, we're there to give not only advice about whether um, that idea has merit, but is it feasible given the current makeup of the legislature? There are some really great ideas out there that just given the climate that exists are never going to go anywhere. And so then the question becomes, do you expend a lot of energy trying to move a bill that you kind of know in the back of your head isn't really gonna go anywhere. And we wanna be good stewards of our time and good stewards of the elected officials time as well. So we're kind of there to offer that kind of feedback. Okay. One of the other initiatives that you've undertaken under your tenure, and it's only been a year. A year. Uh, is trying to promote to the pub, uh, promote the public's awareness of counties and what counties do. Mm -hmm. What are some of the special initiatives that you've done in that area? One of the things that I'm most proud of, and it's mostly because I have zero graphic design experience, but I did this great graphic design piece. It's um, a flyer, essentially. A one-pager front and back, and it's called Arizona Counties Matter. And you can find it um, on our website, azcounties.org. And it's a great infographic. It's not a lot of text. We've learned that, you know, in this day and age, people want to absorb information very quickly, and so we designed it with that in mind. And it's just little pictures that talk about statistics for Arizona's counties. Like, for example, um, counties employ more than 37,000 Arizonans in a wide variety of fields. So we're a huge um, contributor to the job market in Arizona. Counties provide almost a quarter million vaccines to people every year. We have about 212,000 cases that go through Superior Court in any given year in Arizona by the counties. Counties handle just over 20,000 miles of roads in Arizona and just over 1,000 bridges are county responsibilities. So that's just a little snapshot of some of the things that counties are responsible for. We also house mm, almost 19,000 people in county jails on any given day in Arizona. So we're involved in a lot. We also provide education services through the county school superintendents, obviously um, finance and assessment issues through the county treasurer and the county assessor. It's just, it's a wide variety. And you also produced a video. What's we the did. video? So the video is on yourcounty.org. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the video is, um, it's, it's called It's Your County. And what we did is, we used county elected officials from all over the state to talk about the importance of counties, like I just did, but also to make sure that the viewer understands that the county is there to work for them. It's a great little video. I think it's maybe a minute and a half, two minutes long. It's not that long. We have, it's on our YouTube channel, and it's on yourcounty.org, and it features, um, I don't know, maybe eight or ten different elected county officials from all over the state. So it's a really good little, like just a little quick showcase of how great counties are. And I assume that ACO and you will be doing more to raise awareness in the public eye. We do. We're looking forward to kind of being more forward thinking in terms of our media strategy. We, you know, 
our clientele, kind of a lot of old school, moving slowly into the digital age with cell phones and whatnot, and so it's been kind of a slow learning curve for the bulk majority of our membership, I think we're kind of there. And so now it's time to really up our media presence. You know, our Twitter account is going well. Our Facebook account has more than 3,500 likes right now, which is great for a state association of counties. I mean, some of them only have like, you know, 50 or 60. So I'm very pleased with 3,500. Um, and we're trying to post every day just to keep our awareness factor out there. And uh, I think it's, I think we're going in the right direction. Well, Jen, I want to thank you for being our guest today. Oh, it's my pleasure. It was very educational. Good. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Well, thank you for joining us on Shooting Straight with Brad and Casey. And we want to end this show with the ACO video on why counties matter. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you learn from it. And we'll look forward to talking to you again next month. Hello, I'm Liz Archuleta, and I'm from Coconino County. I'm Keith Russell. I'm the assessor for Maricopa County. I'm Dodie Doolittle, and I'm the treasurer from Pinal County. I'm Leon Wilmot, and I'm the sheriff from Yuma County. I am Mary Ellen Dunlap, and I am the clerk of Superior Court from Cochise County. Arizona is a vibrant, growing, and diverse state. A really diverse state. And in this Grand Canyon state of ours, there are 15 counties. And sometimes, what works best in Maricopa County. In La Paz County. Yavapai County. Brown County. Santa Cruz County. Apache or Navajo. Gila County. In Mojave County. Doesn't always work in Pima County. That's why citizens like you elect county officials to make decisions that are best for their communities and to provide essential state services. You may not realize it, but your county provides services that millions count on every day. From elections to public health, law enforcement and public safety, to courts and property record management, and so much more. And every day, we get to hear from you, our neighbors, because it's your county. 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 It is your county. We believe that many times the best ideas start within local communities. We believe the government closest to the people governs best. We believe the citizens are our bosses. And we are so proud to represent you. I'm Ray Carroll. I'm Helen Purcell. I'm Derek Rapier. I love Greenlee County. I love Coconino County. I love Pima County. I love Yuma County. I love Pinal County. I love Cochise County. And I love the state of Arizona. Learn more about Arizona counties at yourcounty.org.